and welcome back to walking through the word today we're going to be looking at ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 10 so grab your bibles and follow along with me there's so much beauty in the church and one of the most profound realities of the church is the unity of the church but also the beautiful realities of diversity diversity of gifts in the church as well and so paul enters into chapter four talking about the beauty of diversity and unity in the lord jesus christ he says in verse one therefore i the prisoner in the lord and yes as we've mentioned in our previous studies he really is a prisoner this is a prison epistle um, paul wrote this while he was imprisoned on one of his missionary journeys and he wrote this letter to the ephesians as a letter of encouragement to them therefore i the prisoner in the lord urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received and this exhortation should be heeded by every christian this exhortation and encourage, encouraging word from paul should be obeyed by every christian we are to walk worthy walking worthy of the calling of the gospel as a necessity for every single born again believer progressive sanctification the ongoing work of the spirit increasing in our maturity increasing in greater degrees of grace that is all part of being a new creature in christ and paul urges the church in ephesus just as he should be urging us and is urging us through this letter to walk worthy of the calling you have received now notice this is a present tense reality you have received this this is already yours this calling this calling is already yours you were called to the lord jesus christ and you should be walking worthy of it. Now, you might ask, well, what does it mean to walk worthy? How do we walk worthy of the calling? Well, he gives us multiple ways of being able to walk worthy of that. In verse 2, with all humility. So number one, walk in humility. See yourself as lesser than others. Not that you are lesser in value or lesser in purpose or lesser in design, but rather you make yourself a servant. And number two, with gentleness, not being aggressive, ensuring that you are love and are gentle towards all the brothers and sisters. Ensure that you are gentle in your words, gentle in your actions, gentle in your texts, gentle in your phone calls. Number three, with patience. Be patient. Be patient with your brother. Be patient with your sister. Be patient with your neighbors. The people of God should be so in love with each other that all they desire to do is be with each other. And if that is the case, and truly the Spirit is uniting them and causing them to have deep love and affections for one another, then inevitably you will just spend a lot of time together. And if you spend a lot of time together, you'll get on each other's nerves sometimes. And other times you might do things that might make you upset. Or you might be offended by someone. Or someone might do something that you don't necessarily like. Be patient. Walk worthy of the calling by being patient. And he expounds what he means by being patient in the next, in the next phrase. Bearing with one another in love. That's really what patience looks like. It's just being able to put up with one another in love. This is what makes 
unity in the church. When we all strive to walk worthy of the calling that we have all received in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we put on humility and we are gentle and we are patient with one another, we bear with one another, then this is what verse 3 looks like. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So, if we wanted to add to walking worthy of the calling, number four would be unity. And number five would be peace. And these are all things that we should all strive for at all times as Christians within the body of Christ. So there's beauty in the unity of the church. Especially as we all strive to walk worthy of the calling that we have received. Verse 4. Here's the beauty of unity. Once again. But also the beauty of diversity as we we'll see here in the following verses. So there is one body. The body here is specifically pointing to the church. That is the body of Christ. So the church locally, because I think since it's written to the church in Ephesus, these next verses, especially in terms of the diversity of giftings, should be kept in mind. Although there should be unity and diversity in the universal church throughout all the world. Yet I think we are to keep the local church in context here. So there is one body and one spirit. Now notice the spirit is the one that's unifying the body, the church. The Spirit is the power of God to unite His people. It is the one that brings us together, assembles us together. So just like there's one church, one body, and the local body is part of the one universal church, but nevertheless, the one body is unified through the one Spirit. He says, just as you were called, this is hearkening back, to the previous verses that you ought to walk worthy of the calling you have received that calling is of the Lord Jesus Christ and he continues here there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope and that hope is Christ the gospel Just as you were called to one hope at your calling, that is the day of your salvation. So at the moment that you were saved, you were called to Christ, to your one hope, to the gospel. And the Spirit is the one who accomplished this great feat in you. And everyone who is part of this one body is also experiencing this calling of one hope. Because everyone united has a very specific day in which they were called. And that's the beauty of the gospel. He says in verse 5, One Lord. So there's one God that we all worship. And that is the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One Master. There's one faith. We've all come to the same saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of our salvation. And there's one baptism. We should have all been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We have all participated in the same faith events. There's one God and Father of all. Now, the word all here is that in reference to 
unbelievers as well. I think it's specifically in the context of the church. And we are to keep in mind the local church here. Now, that's not to say that God is not Lord and Master over all of the universe, and that is true, but in light of the context, I think we are to keep the church in mind. So there's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. And again, these are all in reference to the church. Now, why is Paul making a reference to every person in the congregation, in, in the local church? And I, I think it's because he, he's, he's been establishing this reality over and over again to the Ephesians, that the Gentiles are also partakers of the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are no different. They are not lesser. And so... God has gathered together from both Jewish believers and Gentile believers into one body. And everyone who is part of that body has received the one spirit and have received the one hope and have worshiped the one Lord and have the same faith and have all received the same baptism and they all believe in the same God and they all have the same Father, he's establishing this reality amongst the believers during this time that the Gentiles are co heirs and recipients of the same beauty and power and promises that were given to the Jews. They were no less, they were no different. Verse 7. Now, grace was given to each one. Now, this grace here is not salvation. This is not salvation. Okay? This grace is specifically in terms of gifting. As we'll see here in verse 7. Now, grace was given to each one. This is in reference to the body, to the church. So each one of us, according to the measure of Christ's gift. What is this gift in reference to? Well, we'll learn in our next study in Ephesians chapter 11, that he grants gifts to men. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and shepherds or pastors. Christ grants these gifts to each one according to Christ's gifting. So Christ in his sovereignty has granted to his people, the church, who are all of the same body, who are all of the same faith and baptism and spirit and everything. He has granted them all different gifts, diversity of giftings. And he explains why. For, because, here's the reality. For it says, and this is an Old Testament scripture, when he ascended on high, and this ascension is a reference to post-resurrection, as Paul will expound in verse 9 and 10. When he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. That's an interesting way of saying that. But essentially what Paul is referring to here is that when Christ ascended it back into the heavens to the Father after his resurrection, after he had been crucified and yet three days in the tomb and then rose, rose again on the third day. A few, four, few days later, he ascended up into the heavens. When he ascended, Paul is saying, when he did that ascension, 
he took captives and these captives are in reference to depraved sinners who were lost in their sins, who were imprisoned souls by their own wickedness. He took those imprisoned captives, those wicked, depraved sinners, he took them captive. And that is that he took them and made them clean or righteous. So Christ, when he ascended into the heavens, he took depraved, imprisoned souls, souls that were chained to their own sins. He took those captives that were slaves of their own wickedness and depravity. He took them captive. He made them clean and righteous. He gave them a heavenly citizenship. He transferred them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He took them for himself. And he says, he gave gifts to people. So his ascension resulted in taking captives captive, making them clean and righteous, which then resulted in him giving gifts to people. And the people here, of course, is in reference to the church, the body of Christ. Not just r random people on the earth, but Christ's body. He, he gave them gifts, a diversity of gifts. And he expounds on what he means in the previous verse, in verse 8. What does he mean? He says, but what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth. Now, there is a lot of confusion about what this actually means. A lot of people think this means that he went into the actual center, the core of the earth where there's magma and molten rock. And there are people who believe that there is hell there dwelling in the middle of the earth. But I don't think that's necessarily what he's referring to. He's making an illustrative example of what it looked like for Christ to die and rise again and ascend into the heavens. The imagery of death, resurrection, and power, or glory, that it took the death in order for the glory to take place. So, he cannot ascend if he did not descend. So, what did the scriptures mean that he ascended? Well, he ascended because for the very fact that he also descended. That is, he, he died. And because he died, then he ascended. That is, he resurrected. And he also ascended into the heavens into glory. So without the dissension, without the death of the Son, there is no ascension, there is no resurrection, there is no glory of the Son. And what is but what does he mean then by to the lower parts of the earth? Well it's just a symbol of him entering into death. This is symbolic of or illustrative of the tomb. That he actually did die. That he entered into the lowest parts of the earth. That is death itself. And that's an Old Testament imagery of Sheol. The place of the dead. That's Old Testament imagery of what Sheol looks like is the lower parts of the earth, the place of the dead. Verse 10. The one who descended. Who is the one who descended? Well, obviously, it's Christ. It has to be Christ. He's the one that died for us. 
So Christ is the one that descended because he is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. This is why the ascension doesn't just mean resurrection. It also means the ascension of the Son of God to glory. This is the reality of the unity of the body of Christ, is that the same Jesus who died for the Jews is the same Jesus who died for the Gentiles. And we are now all participating in the one faith, the one baptism, the one Lord, the one Spirit, the one God, the one Christ who is Lord of all, who is above all, who fills all. There is the beauty of unity and diversity in the church because of the realities, all of these realities of the gospel. And in our next study, we will learn what it means for Christ to actually grant these gifts to people. So I pray that you're filled. I pray that this has been edifying and that you have learned and gleaned from God's holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible word. I pray that you are filled with the Spirit and that above all else, that Christ be magnified in you. Until next time on Walking Through the Word.